want to take you back in your minds to the scene in the garden, uh, not the Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus there with his disciples, and uh, those uh, the guard comes up, led by Judas, and what the disciples were first expecting to happen there, you know, no one can say, for example, although we know Peter was willing to fight, but uh, at least from their perspective, as they watch the events that happen, suddenly there's no escape. After three years of the enemies of Jesus despising him and attacking him, suddenly he's taken. And he faces those Jewish trials through the night, and the highest Jewish authorities condemn him. And then he is taken in the daytime before the Roman governor, and the crowds crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And he's condemned to the cross. And Roman soldiers took him and they lead him out. I'm turning to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 31. I'm sorry, verse 39. And those passing by were hur hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him believe, uh, deliver him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. So the mockery that was going on and the soldiers who took what was left of him for their own, chapter 27, verse 35. Uh, and when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots. And by all appearances, uh, you have a man defeated. And I'm sure those were thoughts going through the disciples' minds, not just the 12 disciples, but others who were there uh, watching these events. And we go back to Isaiah chapter 53. In this prophetic picture of the scene, of the trials and the, the crucifixion of Christ. And the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, the second half of that verse, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We looked at him and thought, God is not helping this man. In fact, God is striking this man. And uh, he is no doubt, you know, headed for a terrible fate. Uh, and then, back in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, we read in those final moments uh, before Jesus died on that cross, we read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, that, at first glance, doesn't seem to help their perspective on how things are going with the one they have thought is the Savior. That looks like words of despair, but in fact, it was not despair. That was not a statement of despair, I want to suggest to you tonight, that was a message of hope. For those who knew their scriptures, that was a message of deliverance and victory and praise and celebration and spreading of the message of what happened that day. So it doesn't look like it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It doesn't look like all those nice things. If we look at it on its face, it's, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, I think none of us would say that Jesus was really wondering, questioning, God has forsaken me and I don't know why. 
who of us would be thinking that that's what Jesus meant? That he was really wondering why these things were happening. He knew why all these things were happening. He knew what was necessary. He knew where all of this was headed. So, a message of hope is exactly what Jesus knew his followers needed. Think about them. They'd put their hope and their faith into Jesus back in John chapter 1. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter and says, we have found the Messiah. At the very beginning of his ministry, they quickly got that confidence in him. We go to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, do I want to go to that yet? Uh, no, I don't. I want to go to John chapter 6 first. Um, the, the disciples are following Jesus around the countryside and through the towns. We get to John chapter 6, verse 67, on a day when the crowds have proved themselves to be more interested in the flashy things Jesus could do, the miracles, especially when they involved giving the people food, than they were in really the message of Jesus. And some of them begin to turn away. And Jesus asks the disciples in verse 67, you don't want to go away also, do you, to the disciples, to the twelve? Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. You can see the hope that they've got in Jesus, the trust already in who he is and what he has for them. And then we'll be going to Matthew chapter 16. They were certain that he was the one. They were certain that he was the one who could deliver the, the nation. You know, sometimes when, when we talk about him being the one, I don't know who all of you has seen the Matrix movies or other movies with a similar motif of the one. The one who's going to, to be the, the salvation for everybody. And so we turn back to Jesus and it, it seems a little Hollywood and corny to, to call him the one and talk about people having that hope in him. But, but really, he's the source of, of us having this idea in our heads that sometimes we need somebody to, to stand up and, and have some special ability to save us all. And he's... He's the one who was the original, the one. And it's where we kind of get that idea. So defeat and death for Jesus was the farthest thing from their minds. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often that is not the path. I'm in chapter 18, that's why. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He flatly says he's going to be killed. Peter understood those words. Verse uh, 23, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You see that they know who he is. They just don't understand his mission. But they know who he is, and they think nobody's going to take him. Nobody's going to seize him. Nobody's going to kill him. In Mark chapter 9, uh, the scene of the transfiguration, uh, the transfigura transfiguration of Jesus before the eyes of Peter, James, and John. And in... Uh, verse 9 as they were coming down from the mountain he gave them orders not to my eyes are not as good as they used to be not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the son of man should rise from the dead now that they had heard stories of people being risen from the dead. Um, you know, that this happened a number of times in Old Testament scripture. Um, this is not a foreign thing to them. And yet the idea that Jesus would be would die and, and need to perhaps be risen, raised, um, that is so foreign to them that even though they're familiar with the concept of rising from the dead, 
verse 11, and they ask him, saying, why is it that the scribe, that is not the verse I want, verse 10, and they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. Because obviously it doesn't mean he's going to die. So what does it mean, rising from the dead? But then we go back to the garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is taken by enemies who are known to want Jesus dead. They capture him, they arrest him, the disciples flee. They run away from that scene. And Peter follows from a distance as Jesus is taken to, to the beginning of those Jewish trials, but he doesn't want to be recognized. He's, he's kind of off a little bit where he can kind of see what's going on, but, but not appear too involved. And when they begin to recognize him, he says, no, I don't know that man. <laughs> phrase that man. That's, that's a, a phrase you use when you're trying to distance yourself from somebody. Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, you remember that episode, and, and he referred to her as that woman. He wanted to distance himself from her. Peter says, I don't know that man. And the trials continue, and he's convicted. The Pharisees are successful. He's nailed to the cross, and they are no doubt very disillusioned and scared and confused because it looks like everything's lost. You know, we had all this hope in him. You'll recall the, the two disciples on the road to, to Emmaus when Jesus appears to them uh, after the crucifixion and, uh, and after the resurrection, and uh, they say we, we had hoped that he was the Messiah. We had hoped that he was the Messiah. So that's the scene at the cross with disciples disillusioned and scared and confused, if they're even present, some were at least. But then there's this statement shortly before his death when Jesus loudly cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I've suggested to you that that's a message for them of hope and deliverance and victory. People who knew their scriptures, people who knew the text of the Old Testament, people who knew the Psalms would have immediately caught that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And remember, there's a psalm that begins that way. It was one of the psalms the Jews often knew better than most of the other psalms. Psalm, at least from my understanding, Psalm 22, 23, and 24 were especially well known to the Jews. And this one that begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's go back to Psalm 22, where we're going to spend most of the rest of our time this evening. I believe that Jesus wasn't wondering my God, what? why have you forsaken me? I believe he's referring his listeners back to that psalm because the message that psalm included about even when things look their worst, when things look desperate, when things look like all is lost, God can still show that he is there. And there can be cause for praise and celebration and joy, because there can be deliverance in times even such as that. So, we go back to Psalm 22, and I want us to consider this message. Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this here. I, I know I've commented in some at least cursory way about this psalm uh, here at Hillcrest, uh, and so I may have mentioned this before. In most of the times when I've heard Psalm 22 addressed, uh, it's to look at the first 21 verses and all the parallels with Jesus. And the last third of the psalm, I don't know that I ever really heard presented. And that, that's where the power of this psalm is, is in that last third of the psalm. And so we're going to do the whole psalm this evening. David is the author of this psalm. Of course, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the things in this psalm. And that's the reason for some of the parallel language 
uh, that we read about here, but David is the, the base cause, at least in David's mind, for writing this psalm is some ordeal he is going through in his own life. Some situation where enemies have surrounded him and it looks like everything's going to be lost. And he talks about how he has prayed to God for deliverance and it doesn't look like it's coming. You see the parallel there. And, uh, but as David describes these events in his life, the Holy Spirit guides him in some cases to choose words that are particularly appropriate fitting, descriptive of the situation of Christ on the cross. So David has this thought in his mind, in this terrible situation he's in, and we don't know what situation it was. You know, it could have been the occasion when his son Absalom has turned the people away from David and to, to Absalom himself, and he's bringing troops into the city, and David has to run to escape, and and Absalom is sending troops after him, and you know, it could be that or some similar situation. We don't know what the specific situation is, but some real situation in David's life where his instinct is to utter these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer, and by night, but I have no rest. You see how David is feeling. He's got this terrible circumstance that he's going to further describe in these verses that follow and how terrible it is. And he's prayed to God and prayed to God and prayed to God. And he, he doesn't see God answering him. And so we have that expressed in those first two verses. In the next three verses, verses three, four, and five, David, in, in, these first, in the first two thirds of this psalm, David flips back and forth between how terrible the situation looks right now, and on the other hand, yet, God, you've always been trustworthy. And so here in verses 3 through 5, he turns to that thought that God has always been there for the fathers of Israel, for the forefathers of this nation. He says in verse 3, yet, you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. And you they trusted and were not disappointed. You see, he knows in the history of Israel, God has been there for his people. That when they cried out, God would deliver them. So verses 1 and 2, I pray and I pray and I pray and there's no deliverance. God, I feel like you've forsaken me. Verses 3 through 5, but I know in the history of our nation, you've always been there for us. Then verses 6 through 8, it's back to himself and how terrible things are looking. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head. Remember that passage from Matthew just a few minutes ago? Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. This wagging the head. Now, I've never described someone as wagging their head. I don't know if you have or not. I haven't. It sounds kind of odd to me, but, but maybe it's kind of, you know that movement we make when we're saying something sarcastic, you know, and we, we kind of wag our heads, if I understand the word well. Um, and and the, his critics are being so sarcastic in their mocking of him, of Jesus, as he hangs there on the cross. They sneer at him. They mock him, saying, yeah, commit yourself to the Lord. He'll deliver you. That's what you've been telling us. David uses this language to describe his own enemy. But it's exactly what Jesus' enemies were doing as he hung there on the cross. Um, Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verses 29 to 31. 
and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him and themselves, uh, among themselves and saying, he saved others. They didn't really believe that. They knew Jesus was claiming that, forgiving people. He saved others. He can't even save himself. Then back to Matthew chapter 27 again, and verse 43. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I'm the son of God. So that's what David is seeing all around him as he's facing this trial, this ordeal. Um, in which he, he doesn't see an answer yet. And then, verses 9 and 10, you know, he's already, back in verses 3 through 5, recalled that God was always there for the forefathers of our nation. And now in verses 9 and 10, he recalls even in his own life, he knows that God has been there for him personally. Verse 9, Yet you are the one who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. David knows, yeah, you've been there in my life. You've made my life what it is. But then, verse 11, he turns back to the, to the desperation that he feels because of how things are going. Verse 11, as David expresses in these next few verses, it's just about too late to help me, Lord. Verse 11, do not be far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Think of Jesus on the cross with all these enemies of his around him. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bone, bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. David describing the situation he's in. Now, I don't suppose that David's hands and feet were actually pierced. I suppose it's possible. But I suppose those are words that David used by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit knew that was going to exactly picture for us Jesus on the cross, and David could use them to just f describe how pinned down he feels and the suffering that he feels. And of course, then the reference to uh, his garments being gambled upon. Uh, they cast lots for my clothing and, and how that is reflected in the scene at the cross. But you see the desperation in this. Verse 19, continuing this section. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. It's, it sounds to me like David thinks, you know, this is it. Salvation doesn't come now. It's going to be too late. And it looks like everything is lost. But he didn't answer so far. But then suddenly, and I think the turning point in this psalm is that second part of verse 21. And from the horns of the wild oxen, thou dost answer me. It's such a short line. It seems like it's not enough to be the real turning point that David's been waiting and waiting and waiting for an answer. I, I kind of 
look for, in my mind, because, you know, my mind is not the mind of God. In my mind, I want some big declaration of how God answered and how the deliverance was going to be carried out and all of that. David doesn't do that. He just says, and from the horns of the wild oxen, thou dost answer. I'm not sure what it is with the horns of the wild oxen that may have something to do with uh, the horns on the altar at uh, uh, the temple. The temple represented the presence of God. So maybe maybe some kind of thought somehow related to that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, this answer comes from the presence of God, from the horns of the wild oxen, from the presence of God, you answer. And the whole tone of the psalm changes. And as I said before, I, I've so rarely heard the last part of this psalm discussed, but it's the power of this psalm. David is no longer sounding desperate in the last part of this psalm. And picture yourself now as Peter or John or some other disciple who was there at the scene of the cross. And you we're losing all your hope for Jesus being the one, the Messiah. And you hear Jesus cry out these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it clicks and you think, there's a psalm that begins that way. Is it just coincidence? Or is Jesus pointing me back to that psalm? And so after the answer in the last half of verse 21, notice what David is talking about now. Verse 22 through 25. I will tell of your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. David started the psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But now David affirms, he did not forsake me. Just the answer didn't come as soon as I wanted it to. The answer would come in the wisdom of God's time. And now the answer has come. And David is able to affirm, he had not forsaken me at all. I just had to go through a little bit more of the affliction before the answer came. Um, so David expresses these words of rejoicing. And the disciples, as they read this psalm, after hearing Jesus say these words on the cross, I, I don't know if they ever did or not. Well, I'm sure at some point in their lives they did. But I don't know if, you know, in, in, on that weekend, if they thought and turned to this psalm or not, but if they did and they get to verse 21, they've seen the parallels, they've seen the mockery, they've seen the, the wagging of the heads, they've seen the, the dryness described of Jesus as his strength is dried up like a potsherd. They've seen the, the piercing of the hands and the feet. They've seen the clothing gambled for. They've tied all of that together. And then verse 21, an answer comes and the message from this psalm is deliverance, not despair. That God was paying attention. And even though, yes, Jesus did die on that cross this afternoon, if they were looking at it that evening, this psalm that so clearly is talking about Jesus says that there's deliverance and reason for praise and celebration and rejoicing. And we continue to read, and, and, and I want to mention again that passage from Isaiah chapter 53, where he says, looking on the cross, we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted of God. But that wasn't the case. God was there for the deliverance of Jesus. It just wasn't quite time yet as it had not quite been time yet in the first part of this psalm for David in his own day. But moving ahead with the next few verses of the psalm, Psalm 22, we get to verse 26, and we read in these next few verses, the people will come 
and this message will be spread. Uh, maybe that's a little more for the last few verses, but it's in these as well. And that there's a kingdom. Verse 26. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will worship before you. Doesn't that sound like language of the New Testament about people from every nation and tribe and tongue coming to the Lord? And all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. There's a kingdom. And there's great joy. And people will come and benefit from that. And then the last two verses telling us how the coming generations will be told of these events. You know, going back to David's day, uh, David's own situation that he's describing. David is, I think, talking about his own situation, about suddenly how joyful he is because he's been delivered from whatever this terrible circumstance is, and people will come, and people will celebrate that, and in these last couple of verses, people will tell the coming generations of how I was delivered this day. But of course, Jesus has brought this psalm into the context of his crucifixion and resurrection that's the answer of God in Jesus' day and the kingdom that follows that. And so then verses 30 and 31, posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come, this coming generation, they will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed. The sense of one generation telling the next, and that generation telling the next, about how Jesus went through this terrible experience of his enemies capturing him, arresting him, abusing him, mocking him, piercing his hands and feet on that cross, ripping up his clothes. Well, they actually separated the scenes, but anyway. And yet, God was there for him and raised him from the dead. And one generation will tell the next and the next and the next. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. This message and this psalm was something that had the disciples looked at it, and perhaps they did it, began to realize, okay, Friday afternoon it looked like everything was lost. But maybe somehow, Jesus did talk about rising from the dead. We didn't take that literally. Maybe he meant it literally. Somehow this psalm is pointing us towards celebration and praise for God delivering Jesus through those circumstances. All right, well, just... A few other brief thoughts uh, that we might draw from this. One is, and we especially take this one from David. You can take it from Jesus as well, but I think especially from David. In times of trouble, when things are going terrible for you, and things look really bad, trust the Lord. It's not bad to, to, to realize things look terrible, it's not bad to realize that I don't see an answer coming yet, but trust the Lord. Like David, who said, you know, I, I'm not seeing any help. I'm not seeing any answer to all my prayers, but I know, God, you've been there for our forefathers. And I know, God, you've been there even in my own life. So in times of trouble, trust in the Lord. A second thought that I want to draw from this is just a matter of evidence. Um, you know, there are types, and we've talked about types in the Bible before. Um, Trevor, I think you presented some lessons on types. I've presented a couple of lessons on types. Those, those situations in the Old Testament that sometimes you, 
they're, they're odd enough that you wonder, why did they happen? And yet, they so perfectly model the mission of Christ in the crucifixion and resurrection and salvation of us. And this is another one of those. And you think, how did those happen? How did these stories get written down a thousand, fifteen hundred years before Jesus, uh, before Jesus came? Because there was the mind of God. He knew what he was going to do with Jesus, and he planted those stories back in the lives of men like Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David here in Psalm 22. So that they were there all along, showing that God knew hundreds, more than a thousand years before the time of Jesus, what the life of Jesus was going to be. Third thing, um, and this I feel like, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not going to make that remark. I'm not even going to tell you what that remark is going to be. Um, I don't believe that Jesus was forsaken on the cross by the Father in heaven. Um, and my first thought about that is, David, who was the original one to say the, the original one to say these words, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" Had he been forsaken? No, he he, he felt like he was being forsaken, but in fact he wasn't. Just the answer of God had not come yet. Um, but Jesus said it. Uh, but again, as I pointed out at the beginning, if we take those words literally. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That means Jesus was up there hanging, wondering, what, what's, what's going on? What's this about? Why have you forsaken me? There has to be more to it than those simple words. And I think Jesus said this as a reference back to Psalm 22. It was in the Jewish mind to refer to passages of Scripture by the first part of those passages or the first part of those books. You think about the book of Genesis. What does Genesis mean? What does the word Genesis mean? Beginning. What are the first words in the book of Genesis? In the beginning. In fact, in Hebrew, all that in the beginning, that's one word. It's beginning with a couple of little tails on the beginning and end of the word. Beginning is the first word of the book, and that's what it got named, and we still call it that to this day. The book of Numbers. What is the book of Numbers about? It must be about Numbers. Must be a lot of counting, and you know, probably written by an accountant. No, oh, the book of Numbers is all these laws and journeys, and not much of it has to do with numbers. But the first chapter has to do with counting the number of the people of Israel, and that's why it's called Numbers. The books of Samuel used to be one collective book. We have first and second Samuel. It used to be one whole. Uh, in, in Jewish writings, um, and it's called Samuel. We call it 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, but it's called Samuel. Samuel didn't live through all of that time. 1 and 2 Samuel take us through, yes, the life of Samuel, but then through the reign of King Saul for 40 years, and then through the reign of King David for another 40 years. But the book is called Samuel because it starts with the story of of Samuel. So it makes pretty good sense that Jesus, by quoting these words, the first line from the psalm is pointing them back. Read that psalm. There's also the thought on this question of whether Jesus was forsaken on the cross or not, whether there was a separation between him and the Father or not. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 He made him, God made the Son, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And often that verse is understood to be saying that, that Jesus became sin and God cannot look on sin. We know that. God cannot look on sin. He can't have fellowship with sin. And since Jesus now was sin, God can't have can't share with him, can't have fellowship with him in that time. And so there must have been some separation. 
and and you tie that in with my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you get kind of that view of things. But I think that's the wrong view of things. Yes, Paul says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin. Was Jesus really sin? Well, it's, you know, I feel bad asking that question because I've just read a verse and then, then I ask, is it really? But there are things metaphors, and similes. I, uh, I've i never been able to remember which is which. I had to look it up again in preparation for preaching this tonight. Which is which? A metaphor and a simile. I'm going to use Tom Hanks' line from his, quoting his mother in the, in the, in the movie Forrest Gump. But, no, sorry, Forrest Gump quoting his mother, played by Tom Hanks. Life is like a box of chocolates. That is a simile. Life is a box of chocolates, is a metaphor. Life is or life is like the thing. So what if in the movie he had said life is a box of chocolates? We wouldn't begin to, you know, what? life is a box of chocolates? It's a metaphor. And when we read that God made Jesus to be sin. I don't believe that means that somehow Jesus was sin. He was a person. He was not the abstract noun sin. Abstract noun, is that the right term like honesty, purity, or those abstract nouns? There's a word for that kind of noun. I can't remember what it is. I think it's abstract. Jesus did not suddenly become an abstract noun sin. He was still a person. He was still who he was. But he represented sin on the cross. He took the suffering due to sin on the cross. But I don't think any of that means that somehow Jesus actually was sin, and therefore God had to turn away and not have any fellowship with him for that time. And I think the power of Psalm 22 is the message that even though it looked like David was forsaken, in truth, he was not. And even though it looked, Isaiah chapter 53, we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. Even though it looked like Jesus was forsaken, because everything was going so wrong, I suggest to you that he was not forsaken, that God was there with him, uh, that, uh, that there wasn't that kind of separation between the Father and the Son. All right, well, that's our lesson for this evening. And I'll close on that thought of trust. Uh, in times of life, when things are hard, when things look terrible, when you're desperate for a solution, when you're desperate for some relief, for some comfort, don't give up on God. You may have to go through some more suffering. David had to go through more suffering after he started... Uh, you know, after the events of the first few verses, he still had to go through more suffering. But in the end, God was there and delivered him. Uh, so trust in that uh, as we face situations in our own lives. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing our song of invitation. I believe it was at 818. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight, things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. Let's stand and sing. I am 